Welcome. Today we are hosting a series of webinars known as AIM Across the Lifespan. This is a series that will be housed in our Accessible Educational Materials group in the OER Commons. Uh, that is OER uh, in a world of acronyms, that's Open Educational Resources. We will be uh, under the Oregon Open Learning Hub you see a QR code that can take you there, but Chandra will also drop a link in the chat box. You will have access to the handouts. And again, Chandra will drop that link into the chat box. Today, our first session in the series, we're going to be talking about AIM in early childhood and the idea that meaningful inclusion really begins with access. If we intend to include people, we need to make sure that they can get to the classroom and get to the curriculum that we're offering. So uh, sit back and uh, relax and uh, let us know what your questions are. I am pleased to welcome you. My name is Deb Fitzgibbons. I am the coordinator for the Oregon Technology Access Program and for regional and statewide services for students with orthopedic impairment. And uh, I am not an early childhood specialist. My specialty, my expertise has been in um, the area of my master's with assistive technology so I'm all about access. And I'm also uh, one of the leaders of the Oregon AIM cohort. We are in partnership with the National AIM Center, and that is Accessible Educational Materials. We're in a technical assistance grant that uh, is, we are in our fourth and final year of that grant in putting together, making sure that we're bringing a system uh, to our state that uh, allows us to present uh, materials in a timely manner to all of our students. The logo that you see here um, talks about our goals. We are all about creating a coordinated system um, with the leadership and uh, re, uh, housing of communications and resources. And you'll see too that we have a primary goal for student advocacy and helping our students know what they need and being able to advocate for that as we uh, work with them in early childhood and through K-12 when we release and uh, allow them to fly when they leave us. We hope that we uh, have empowered with them not only with the tools, but with the available or the um, the skills to be able to ask for it uh, in their future and in the education that comes after their formal education. So Oregon AIM cohort, uh, this is my contact information and Chandra can put that in the chat box. If you have questions, we welcome those at any time. So uh, part of this uh, cohort is uh, making sure that we're talking about this across the lifespan. We have a focus on K-12, of course, uh, but we know that kids in early childhood need to be prepared for K-12. We need to make sure that we're looking at accessibility at an early age. And then, of course, when our students leave the K-12 world and go into higher education, we need to make sure that we're having these conversations with uh, workforce development, with transition, um, and, of course, parents are included every step of the way. So these are some of the topics that we're offering in our AIM Across the Lifespan. We also have an AIM for Inclusion um, webinar series. It's monthly. Uh, we are uh, recording those and housing them in the same place. I'm going to ask Chandra to please drop a link to the information about that series. And as we move forward today, we are focused this morning on early childhood. So some of our objectives, we wanna make sure that we're on the same page as far as vocabulary. You may be doing things in your world uh, that are the same as what we're doing. Maybe we just call them something different. So we wanna make sure that we're on the same page. We're going to reference a few laws that pertain to the provision of AIM. And going beyond an abstract idea of accessibility, we're going to connect the dots, sharing a few examples of some of the assistive technology and some ideas that are applicable in early childhood environments. One of the uh, 
resources that OTAP, the Oregon Technology Access Program, provides is a short-term loan library. So we'll be talking about um, some tools that you may uh, want to consider in the early childhood world, and uh, we will talk about how to uh, get those for short-term loans so that you can try them out. So we start with the message from our state. The Oregon Department of Education tells us that we are all considering equity, diversity, inclusion, and access. These are the keystones and the rationale for all of the changes uh, set out by the Oregon Department of Education. Now, when we think about it, access is used in a lot of different ways. So I'm going to ask you if you want to take a moment to just type into the chat box, what does access mean? mean to you? I know the answer, Deb. <laughs> so as you think about that, uh, some of the comments we get are access, being able to get some to something, absolutely. Being able to have the resources to join and get to a school or to have the same resources on one side of the state as, as the other. And yes, all of those things are about access. The access that we are focused on today is more about accessibility as it relates to um, uh, students who have more complex needs. So the definition that you're seeing here is uh, comes from the Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center site. I mentioned to you that I'm not a, um, a childhood expert. I'm all about the technology and accessibility, but I did um, uh, partner with and uh, collaborate with uh, the folks at ODE um, and also the Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center. Uh, Janie Kozlowski there um, is at the University of North Carolina. So I'm bringing to you the information uh, as a result of the collaboration. We wanted to create create a presentation that be, could be used uh, by us or by any of you. So make sure that you uh, take a look at this. If you want to use it, please do. Information is only good if you share it. But these are the people who've come together. Accessibility um, and the uh, Childhood Technical Assistance Center really uses a, Wik a Wikipedia uh, definition on their site. And it is the degree to which a product, device, service, or environment is available to as many people as possible. And accessibility can be viewed as the ability to access. Yes, I know that's what was in your mind, is the ability to access and to get to something. So the concept often focuses on disabilities or special needs, of course, um, but it also goes beyond that to make sure that there is no barrier. Uh, we are not the gatekeepers of information that it, people have access to it. So those uh, accessible educational materials, well, what does that look like in early childhood? Well, uh, they your students may not be uh, using chapter books at this point, but they may uh, be using books uh, and you're introducing those. And uh, we need to make sure uh, that all of the print or the technology-based materials that we're giving them aim, including anything that's printed, anything that's electronic, any core materials um, that they are usable across the widest range of learner variability, regardless of the format. So when we are putting materials in the hands of our students, we need to make sure and be asking ourselves, who am I leaving out? How can I make sure that access these materials are accessible to all of our kids? So in the K-12 world, this is really the graphic that we are using and uh, to bring it together, a person with a disability, they need to be able to get to the same information, engage in the same interactions, enjoy the same services. And this point is key with equivalent ease of use. We, they don't have to jump through extra hoops to get what they need. We provide it in a timely manner and that they have the same opportunities as students with out disabilities. So when we take a look at what the why, well, obviously, making sure that our kids are included and can get to our tables is a good enough why for most of us. It's our passion. But 
there comes time when we have to uh, show this is uh, the legislation and this is what we're following. IDEA assurances show us that a part of the application pro uh, process includes consideration of materials. As it says here in red, separately assures that all instructional materials are provided in a timely manner to persons who are blind or others with print disabilities. Now, some of this verbiage needs to be changed. Uh, print disabilities now in an IEP is more known as um, a, a qualified, or what is the word? I, all of a sudden, I just lost it, um, an eligible person. So uh, this is something you may not be thinking about in the early years, but this is how um, the mindset is as our students progress. We want to make sure that what we're offering um, is in, a, in compliance. And for um, from the Office of Civil Rights, Requiring use of an emerging technology in a classroom environment when it, uh, the technology is inaccessible to an entire population of individuals with disabilities, well, here's your bottom line. That's discrimination. And we want to make sure that these tools are available and that people have access, that they're able to participate, and that they are able to um, contribute to the classroom. After all, Life is a participation sport. We need to help our kids get the tools uh, that they need to do that. Here in Oregon, uh, the uh, OAR uh, also um, states that schools districts must ensure, again, timely provision of materials in accessible formats. So uh, timely provision means at the same time as their peers. So when we look at uh, the big movement, the National Association of Education for Young Children, uh, the statement on inclusion, early childhood inclusion embodies the values, policies, and practices that support the right of every infant and young child in his or her family, regardless of their ability, their strengths, or their barriers, to participate in the range of activities uh, throughout their learning, uh, first with their families, in their schools, in their communities, and societies. So the results of inclusive experiences uh, create a sense of belonging, and that is key. We need to make sure from the very beginning in the early years that our kids know that they are learners and that we are here to help them to reach their full potential. So defining the features, uh, early childhood and program services, access, partic participation, and supports. I offer also um, some resources, a link to an interview uh, early on in our um, acceptance into the national cohort uh, for this time period. Um, it, we had a conversation with the National AIM Center and with the folks at, um, in, at ODE, including Meredith and uh, Mandy Stanley. And again, coming back to access, participation, and supports from the national level uh, to the state level, this is our focus. So how do we do that? How do we include kids who um, have not always been included? Well, it's talking to each other and finding, uh, finding ways to share and meet you where you are and go to the next spot. We know that there's not a whole lot of uh, higher level educational materials, but we also know that precursors to disabilities that are apparent during the preschool years, as highlighted here, help us to know that we need to be preparing our kids. They may not be qualified as an eligible person at this point, but we do need to see that they have difficulty in accessing material and help them work through that. Um, and we are, what we are linking them to and giving them access to literacy. Well, the process of reading and writing, we know that starts early. We need to be starting early with access. All kids have to be actively engaged. Um, and so if somebody is not able to access, how can they ever be engaged? And I'm not going to read all of these because you can read those yourself in the handouts, but I will point out the technology, media, and materials, the last point, dramatically impact a student's ability to demonstrate what they know and to learn and to grow. So in the early uh, literacy classroom, again, we're looking at accessible materials, accessible formats, accessible technologies. The key word here is access, and it is uh, listed all through the, uh, the 
really new uh, just this year, the early literacy framework uh, that uh, ODE has put out. And I'm going to ask Chandra to put a link to that early literacy framework in the chat box. You will have links uh, in your handouts. But this is Oregon's stance from, uh, from the get-go, is making sure that kids have the tools they need. So when we consider this as that first level of making sure that kids have access, that's the tier one access. When we think about universal design for learning, it's that tier one where we're making sure that everybody has what they need. So if we're designing up front to include accessible materials, then it really prevents the need for us down the line to run out of the classroom and make a copy of something and try to make it digital for someone. Let's plan this up front. You've probably seen this framework. It really gives us multiple means of ways to engage. So someone who isn't able to turn pages is going to have more difficulty engaging. Means of representation. So making sure that we are uh, providing options and uh, we uh, can do some additional professional development on universal design, but it really provides meaningful action and expression and leads to a student who is, uh, who is goal directed. So more on UDL, but these are just more reasons why it all comes together under accessible educational materials. We view this as the foundation for all of the initiatives that we're working on. Again, acronym CITI, but the first one, PBIS, about behaviors. If kids aren't able to get to the material, oftentimes they are sitting with the world passing them by and who wouldn't have behaviors if you weren't included. Again, universal design, RTI, uh, ties it all together under that umbrella of MTSS, but AIM is a foundation for all of these initiatives. So some of the key findings we know, no surprise here, uh, family is, engagement is, in, is crucial. And we know that particularly in the early years, that's the support system that we're working with. But that is always true. The family engagement is true across the lifespan, at just the same as accessibility is. So family engagement is essential. And communication must be uniform and seamless to prevent fragmentation. So it needs to be a concerted effort and people uh, having the same um, mindset and very much a positive mindset. So when we think about it, well, what is stopping people? Why isn't everybody giving materials to get? Why isn't everybody making sure that everybody gets access? Well, there are probably lots of barriers. A lot of it has to do with education and maybe not knowing um, how to um, how to make it work where the rubber meets the road. Uh, oftentimes in, in history, early childhood was um, more of a, a, a daycare, but now we know that hasn't been true for a long time, that there is curriculum, that there should be uh, goals and uh, developing literacy. But some of the barriers, um, this is kind of shocking that 32% uh, of babies receive screenings uh, to identify delays or areas of concern. So these are some things that we're looking at. 45 states don't require minimum levels of training for uh, our early childhood, and that is changing, but how can people implement what they don't know? So 37% of parents uh, read to their babies every day. Uh, we know there's lots of reasons for that, but these are some of the things that make early literacy complicated. All right. There's some of the foundation. We've talked about what it is, uh, what uh, that means. And so let's get a little deeper into that. Where do we begin? Well, as I said, a lot of this begins with an attitude to know that um, it's not the student who is has the barrier well we've created a barrier for them so we don't want to look at the student as the as if they are broken and that's been a lot of our history but looking at our system and say how are we letting our kids down whenever we're not helping them to get the tools to participate how can we let them go at the end of their education sending them off um, expecting somebody to 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 do things for them and enabling them knowing uh, really comes from a place of positivity and plan for the strengths it requires knowing your students knowing that there is diversity and how can we meet that so 
We need to anticipate who is in your classroom every day and who might be coming there. Are there learners who have fine motor who might have trouble turning pages? How about learners who have visual barriers? We know that a lot of kids now are coming through with what is known as COVID babies and, and CVI, cortical visual impairment, seems to be on the rise. I know it is across Oregon. I'm hearing that from our therapist, but this is uh, something we need to consider when uh, we think about who's coming to our classroom. How about learners with comprehension challenges? You bet. If they're not there, they're going to be. Do you anticipate you'll learn or have learners who have difficulty communicating? You betcha. Again, if they're not there, they will be. Do we wait till they come? Now, this is kind of where we think about that upfront planning and knowing that these kids are going to be there. What can we do to make sure that our classrooms are welcoming? So when we consider that uh, the previous uh, common format and, and many times now, uh, our districts who were really engaged in um, technology, many of them go have gone back to paper and huh, uh, we could go on all day about that, but giving options. Now, when we think about paper, who is it that has a hard time? Well, those very students who we were just talking about, who we know are coming to your classroom. So when we think about uh, providing options, uh, again, uh, this statement comes from NAEYC, technology can enable children with a range of functional abilities to participate in activities and experiences in inclusive settings. So these are some of the keys. Now, I know a lot of people will say, I'm not introducing technology in those early years. They spend too much time on it anyway. Well, I have to say that there's lots of teachable moments and there's right ways and wrong ways. I wouldn't hand a, a, an iPad and give unlimited time. But for some of our kids, the technology is really what's going to bridge the gap for them. So considering uh, that maybe we need to do set, uh, set some limits. But technology can help our kids be more engaged. So when AIM really works, we are looking at the trifecta here. We're looking at the information, the content. We're looking at the technology that everybody has access to and knowing that whatever that technology is, sometimes we're going to have kids who need more, who need assistive technology uh, for some of the things that we're going to talk about in a moment are switches to be able to access those apps on an iPad. So when these three things come together, uh, these components, then we are looking at a healthy system. So uh, most of you are probably familiar with what assistive technology is. Every state has an assistive tech act. OTAP is more leaning towards the educational environment. Uh, Oregon and all states do have a tech act. Uh, the assistive technology, the definition that you have always seen, is any item, piece of equipment, software, product system, anything that is used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of persons with disabilities. And this can be something uh, all the way from low-tech up to high-tech, uh, hardware, uh, so many things that can be included. So it's your thingamabobs and your whatchamacallits and the things that come off the shelf that way or things that you create and adapt to a student. So according to the ECTA Center, Early Childhood Technical Assistance, assistive devices and services can be of great value in providing infants and young children with disabilities opportunities to learn and interact. It brings them into the world with their peers. So it can help them participate, play, uh, communicate, make choices, and move about. We know that there are benefits for young children. We've already talked about some of those, but think too that there are going to be benefits for other children in the classroom. First of all, the inclusion piece in itself is having everybody learn with and from each other. But when we offer options, so today, class, I'm going to be reading a book for those of you who really like for me to read to you. Some of you are going to prefer to put on the headphones over there and listen to the book. And uh, some of you are just going to take the book. And I know you like to sit in a corner and read on your own. So these are your options. And everyone is able to make these choices. So some of the things that happen is the assistive technology can be available, yes, for that student who absolutely needs it. 
It needs to be documented as such. But when we give options, including accessible uh, materials, this makes it better for all of our kids with or without disabilities. It starts to take away some of that stigma uh, that goes along with being, uh, with using something different. So some of the examples might be tactile books that include a combination of print and braille. Uh, you can adapt many of your books by putting, uh, uh, making them uh, tactile and, and gluing on pom-poms or uh, page fluffers to help kids turn the books. Uh, OTAP uh, and works in partnership with OHSU to bring workshops um, about how to do that. Uh, it could be tactile representation and some of the things you can use your 3D printers for. It could be videos. And you all have access to closed captioning here. Um, the audio descriptions, uh, all of these pieces help us to engage. And um, there are mobile apps, of course, that are compatible with assistive technology. So we need to make sure that we are considering this. Again, who am I leaving out? So when we're thinking about what's happening in the UDL classroom, the scenario that I just mentioned about giving kids options, well, whenever you read a story, some kids are watching a video clip because that helps to cement the learning. Some are playing tic-tac-toe trivia over here. We know that some of our kids are really good at word puzzles and are kind of competitive. So we've got that group over here. But giving options in different ways, uh, maybe something that is outside of the box for what's happening in your environment. But when we start incorporating these, we're going to increase the engagement, uh, participation, and, and kids are going to learn what they need. So after reading a story, again, you might um, have kids put sticky notes, uh, make pictures, um, use some cookie sheets and, and magnets and create a scene to show comprehension and how things move. And Switch adapted toys. This is another one of the workshops that uh, we uh, co-partner with OHSU to produce in how to create your own switch adapted toys. And so if you have uh, interest in that, please drop in the chat box or send us a note and we'll, we'll get back with you. What we're talking about is an idea uh, that in the world of assistive technology, we talk about for a long time, uh, we talk about feature matching. If you were going to get an app for you that was going to deal with some a, a potential barrier, if you were going to find an app that reminds you of things, well, you'd think about, well, what do I need? Well, it needs to have an auditory piece. I need to be able to speak into it, uh, to program it. I need to. So you're thinking about what you need and then you're going out to find it. That's what we need to help our students to do. Look at what their uh, potential barriers might be. Look at the needs, look at their abilities and look at how can we make sure that they can access it, participate. And sometimes we're going to look at the interface um, the processing, output, and then some of the general technology features. So these are some of the things as we move forward. So first, we'll take a quick look at some of the tools uh, for access for participation and independence. This is not an exhaustive list. This is some of the ideas. And by the way, these things are available in the loan library to check out so that you can get 45 days worth of experience to see if it will work for a student. But this is alternative methods of access and input. So the first thing you see is a switch adapted toy that I can plug in a switch, such as what you see in the lower left-hand corner here. I can plug in a switch and now that student can hit that switch to make the toy active. Now, imagine if this was a literacy uh, session and you were talking about the big bad wolf. Maybe you have a wolf as a, a toy and that child can now interact with the story because they can make that wolf move uh, when it goes towards uh, the little pig's house. So you there are so many options on switches. Some of you are probably more familiar with these uh, than I am, but switches can be, for if your student 
or you have access to uh, any or, or have control over any part of your body, that might be a good place to put a switch. So even our kids who uh, look like they may not have control over um, their uh, limbs or um, their, uh, their core, do they have control over their eyes? And is that something that could be developed? The tool that you see uh, up in the corner here is a uh, Skyle. Um, it does have um, eye control. So if a student has control over their eye movements, this can give them access to uh, the curriculum, to the classroom, to games that help them be part of their social world. So the first thing we're looking at, and to us, that tier one access is um, making sure that they are able to get to the tables, able to be part of those conversations. Speaking of conversations, are they able to give their input? Are they able to uh, share what they're thinking? Um, are they able to uh, express their needs and wants? Um, this is another area where communication is key to helping be part of life, but also uh, can be key to, um, to help control behaviors and, and executive functioning. Uh, just think yourself, if you have a sore throat, uh, today, you're not able to communicate with people. How frustrating is it when people keep saying, I can't understand you. So we need to really start early and, and help a child to find their voice. The folks at ODE Early Childhood who were part of a collaboration said that this is one of the main areas. This and switches are the main areas that kids are not getting what they need. And we realize that sometimes you might need a little bit of help in knowing how to use that. Well, you can certainly get some of the lower tech items such as the Go Talks, which by the way, I think are being discontinued, uh, but we'll be looking at different devices. Um, but I'm asking uh, Chandra to please put a link in the uh, chat box. OTAP does have an ongoing professional development known as Echo Voices. We also archive those, so you are able to go in and um, join us live uh, this year. They're talking about all of these products and the features that go along with them, but they too are housed um, in or recorded so that you can refer to those recordings. So we've got some that are tactile, uh, some that are one button that you can use for single activities. So lots of, um, lots of considerations when you're bringing these to a classroom, but these are some of the tools that you may want to explore. So there are lots of apps that come on the iPad. If you borrow from us um, in our loan library, you'll be able to get the iPad with the app on it. We can load LAMP. Uh, this one is about motor planning. Uh, many of you have heard of Prolo Quota Go, uh, Touch Chat. Uh, it, it, there are many of them. If there's another one that you're using, feel free to type that into the chat box. Uh, we'll make sure that that's available um, if it, is, it already isn't. We're not trying to sell you anything. We're trying to support the apps and the tools that you're already using. So these are some of the things that you may take a look at. This is one that is very popular. It's known as the pen friend. We have a couple of different versions of this, but the pen friend is a just a pen that looks just like this. You're going to have dots that you can put on any page. You can put dots next to the um, to the coat uh, section that has that somebody can put it up to and talk uh, where you record what today or record the entry routine perhaps. This is was designed as a a label that the recording can be made in the pen. It was designed for um, more of the elderly population so that they would know what, what medicine they have in their hand using the pen friend, but there's great application in the classroom. And we have uh, probably 30 of these uh, available uh, for the loan library. So let us know if you wanna borrow one of those. So that's really a tool for processing and compre uh, comprehension. We also have the BEAMS. Uh, the BEAMS, B-E-A-M-Z, uh, is a tool that allows kids to participate in music and activities. Um, this is where you would break the BEAM uh, to create sound. It is something that's available, very popular. So if you have a student who uh, isn't uh, able to 
uh, use some of the tools. Maybe if they can only move their foot, you can set this up so that when their foot moves and they break the beam, they're able to create music. So again, tools for participation and being part of what's happening in the classroom and what's happening in the community, the family, and life. So the uh, final area that we're talking about today is another tool for processing and comprehension, giving kids a way to organize their thoughts. This is something with, um, with executive functioning. Uh, Choice Works is one that I've known for a long time, um, that it has been one that I've known and loved, and you may have others that do something very similar. But you can put in the list of activities or break down uh, do a task analysis and put them in, uh, uh, they'll go on the left column of what, uh, what I need to do. And then when it's done, I can mark it all done and it moves to the other side. It can have a timer set with it so that at the end of the timer um, that the child knows that it's time to do something else. It can have a prompt. When they're done, you'll also see that it, they, it can give them choices. Okay, you're all done with this activity. And here it's showing the nighttime schedule. When you're done with this, now I can do this or this. So I can have some uh, time with um, reading or whatever it is that motivates this child. That's the Choice Works app. Pretty cool. So I mentioned the uh, Lone Library, and I'm going to ask Chandra to drop a link to the um, OTAP page. And in, on that page, you'll see uh, what's here on the left, the OTAP Lone Library. Uh, we are housed, OTAP is housed in with our public library here in Roseburg. So you will, um, you'll be directed to the catalog that is on there in their database. So you'll be able to see if you go to their catalog and you type in OTAP, it'll bring up all of our holdings. The link here is to a loan agreement that you can complete and Chandra, uh, is the one who receives those. She'll contact you. She'll let you know whether we have it or not. And then she will send it out to you uh, based on availability. Try it, use it, and uh, let us know. Is that working for you? Uh, we have uh, listings in our loan library, but we're always open to what are the tools that are most needed in your environment. So I'm coming to the end, and again, it's hard to take all of this that you want to say, especially when you're passionate about it. And if anybody knows me, it's hard for me to get off of my soapbox. But I hope that we've given you an overview of what we need to consider, the why, some of the how, connecting some of the dots. And I want you to uh, feel free now to um, unmute yourself if you would like. Um, this is my email. This is my phone number. If you have um, a follow-up question, please feel free to do that now. If you have a suggestion for what you might need or some supports that you may need uh, to make these ha things happen, I'm going to stop sharing. And I am going to invite you to open um, your mic and or uh, Chandra, maybe there were some things in the chat box. Maybe this is something that you're just new to thinking about. We don't even know what we don't know to be able to ask questions, but now's the time to do that. Chandra, was there, were there any questions that people had? Um, I, I was asked how items were sent out from the loan library. Okay. Um, so I, I typically send them out UPS. And um, occasionally someone will come and pick them up from me at the office uh, if they happen to be close by or passing through. And of course, if you happen to be at, say, one of our conferences or a meeting, I'm happy to meet you there and, and drop it off with you. And so the loan library is part of our... Um our obligation or, or under the grants and OTAP and RSOI are both grants through Oregon Department of Education. They've been housed at the Douglas ESD uh, for now 35 years of a two year grant. So um, this loan library is part of what we do and it is available from corner to corner of our state and across uh, the 
stakeholder groups, parents, uh, teachers, uh, you are able to check these again for 45 days to give you an idea on whether or not it's something that's going to work for uh, you and your student. Um, many of the items we can also give you um, give you support on what that looks like um, on um, how you can integrate that if you're looking at apps. Uh, most of the uh, makers of those apps have lots of resources built into their websites. It's amazing. Uh, you can go there. Most of those are free. And uh, whether you uh, have their product or not, you can go and onto their site and look at their resources. Uh, a lot of people don't do that because they think they're only trying to sell them something. Um, but really, most of our uh, communication and our AT folks uh, really started um, with inclusion and many times uh, with kids that were on their caseloads uh, uh, as practitioners and now they're trying to find a way to make sure everybody has it. So a lot of those companies have roots in accessibility from their own experiences. And we do have plenty of uh, videos on our YouTube channel and in the archives uh, to help learn how to use these tools as well. Okay. So with that, we are coming to the end of our time. If you have additional questions, feel free to post those. Uh, we will have another session coming up on the hour uh, when we welcome uh, Casey Fernandez. Uh, Casey is going to talk to us about um, uh, accessible libraries in our schools. Uh, the material, of course, will be one that will be shared in trainings with uh, librarians to know their role, because we all have a role. And the librarian can help us to make sure that they are purchasing things that are, do come in digital format, etc. So Casey's going to be joining us on the hour. Uh, go ahead and take a break. We're not going to shut things down, but we are going to uh, take just a moment and again start on the hour. Uh, thank you for being here of all the places you could have chosen. Uh, we're glad you're right here with us.